today we're going to talk about, look at a text of scripture that deals with the, uh, the result of people going to that fountain that's filled with blood, drawn from the maple's veins, and being cleansed by it, and being born again, coming into the body of Christ. We're going to look at the book of Acts this morning. We're going to take a step away from 1 John for a week, and we're going to look at the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 42 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, written by Luke, giving the historical account of the spread of the gospel and the missionary movement that comes from the, the earliest church of the apostles and then ultimately into all the world. Starts here in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42, where the scripture says this, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you give us your word. We're grateful particularly for what this part of the scriptures tell us about what happened on that day of Pentecost and the result of that. And how that earliest church live and thrive in you. Lord, give us ears to hear this morning and hearts to receive. I pray that if there be anything in this room or anything in our presence that is of evil, that you would drive it away. I pray, Lord God, that you would help us to, uh, to win the spiritual battle by focusing on you and you alone. Lord, I pray that your word would resonate in our hearts and in our minds that you would give me the words to say, that you would keep me from doing harm to your word, that you may be honored here this morning, and that we may be edified. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. What is the church supposed to look like? You know, which is a different question than what is the church. The church ultimately is the body of Christ. It's all those who are in Christ those who have been born again, those who have been baptized into the body, that's the church. And we, we come together as local congregations, the local church, and we worship the Lord as the body of Christ, with Christ as the head. And there is a church universal as well. All those who are in the body of Christ are part of the church universal. One day, when the Lord returns for his body, uh, there will be... Uh, after judgment, resurrection and judgment, there will be only the body of Christ that exists in the presence of the Lord, while those who are not the body of Christ will be under the wrath of God. But what should the church look like? And I think this text tells us what the church should look like. See, what's going on in, in this text is we've got the, the results of the day of Pentecost. What was the day of Pentecost? It was a, a Jewish uh, a feast where the Holy Spirit was given uh, to the, the, the apostles. The promise of the giving of the Holy Spirit by the Lord Jesus Christ was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. And on that day, many miraculous things happened, uh, the most of which was that the apostles began speaking in the tongues of the people who were there, because there were many people who were not particularly uh, of an of a Aramaic tongue who were there in Jerusalem that day. And the Lord God poured out His Holy Spirit on the apostles, and they began to speak in tongues. And these tongues, uh, we are told in the text, were the languages of the people who were there. So in other words, you had the apostles proclaiming the gospel in languages that they didn't know, but the people who were hearing it were hearing the gospel 
in their own language. It would be like me, an English speaker, all of a sudden, if, if you were from uh, Russia and you were in here, the whole, and the Lord God got a hold of me, poured the Holy Spirit out of me in such a way that I began finding the gospel in Russian so that you would understand the gospel. That's what's going on today at Pentecost. Um, that day, the text tells us, if you look at verse 41 of the same chapter that we just read, so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Pretty big day for, for the body of Christ, I would say. About 3,000 people come to that fountain uh, that is overflowing with the blood of, of Emmanuel, drawn from the veins of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, about 3,000 people covered by the blood of the Lamb, uh, born again, made regenerate, and, and made into people who are now followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, brought into the body of Christ, actually baptized as well. That had to be quite a working day for the apostles to baptize roughly 3,000 people in one day. That's a, a pretty big event to take place, a monumental event. And this is the earliest church. Sometimes we get wrapped up in the fact that the miraculous took place on the day of Pentecost and then there were 3,000 added. It's a beautiful thing. We talk about it as the greatest uh, missionary event, if you will, in the history of the church. But if you lose verses 42 through 47, we kind of lose the meaning of what happened up to that point. Because it's in 42 and 47 that we see what the church, a Holy Spirit-filled church, looked like. And it would stand the reason that even though we are living in the same time and we are living in the same circumstances, that we as the body of Christ should be seeking to look like the first and greatest church. The church at the day of Pentecost and the day after Pentecost. See, we've got a convoluted notion of what the church looks like too many times. We think of the church, first of all, and too many of us just think of the building. Well, the building's nice, uh, and we are grateful to have a building to come together and worship in, but the building is not the church. Never has been, never will be the church. Doesn't matter how nice you make it, uh, or how uh, toned down you make it, it doesn't matter if you line the, the walls with, with plated gold, uh, or, or if you have high cathedral ceilings, or if you just have a little wooden shed of a room, it doesn't matter. The building is not the church. It is simply a tool to use by the body of Christ to bring glory to the Lord. But that's it. It's not the church. In Baptist life, we think of, of the church, what the church is supposed to look like. We think you're supposed to have a nice building. You're supposed to have a choir. You're supposed to, you know, in many days, in many places, you're supposed to wear a suit and tie. You're supposed to, uh, you know, have uh, committees. And you're supposed to have uh, different activities going on. You're supposed to have events happening for the, for the kids. You're supposed to have events happening for the adults. You're supposed to have this, that, and the other thing. A lot of busyness happening and these sorts of things. And oh, by the way, on Sunday morning we come together and we pray. And we, we hear from a, a, a sermon that's usually a three-point sermon. We sing a few songs. We give a little money and we go home. And that's kind of what the church is supposed to look like. I submit to you that the Word of God tells us what the church is supposed to look like. And too many times we are too busy making the church into our own, own image to listen to what the Word of God says about the church and what it's supposed to look like. This passage tells us. And I would submit to you that if we adhere to this passage that it would break through many of the uh, preconceived notions that we have of what the church should look like. And I also would submit to you that as we look through this passage, we'll see some aspects of what was going on there that, that are evident in the present day church, but should be magnified. There are five different things that are clear about what was going on in the first church. A church that is clearly, because Scripture tells us this, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, these five points are not my own points. They are from a, a man that I respect greatly uh, named Bill Cook. But I think as you read through the text, it's very obvious that these are five, the five things that are, that are going on in the early church. 
The first of them is that the early church from the day of Pentecost forward was devoted to the teachings of the apostles. The apostles and those in teaching roles were devoted to teaching the word of God. And those who were a part of the body were dedicated and devoted to learning the word of God. What's the text say? Verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Primary. First thing. First thing that Luke says about what was going on in the first church, in the earliest church, after the day of Pentecost. 3,000 Holy Spirit-filled believers. Uh, the apostles are there. This is church as it's supposed to be. And what is the primary thing? The first thing that is brought up by Luke as he describes what's going on in the early church. They are dedicated, they are devoted, it says, to the apostles' teaching. Well, what is the apostles' teaching? Well, the apostles' teaching for us, because we don't have apostles in this day and time. They died out after that first century. The ones who were established by the Lord have died out now. But the, the teaching of the apostles is still with us. Do you remember what the first chapter of 1 John says? that we have been looking at here since I've gotten here. What did the Apostle John write late in life before he died? It sounds an awful lot like what was going on in the first church that John was part of, by the way. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life is made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. What are the teachings of the apostles? It's the teachings of Jesus. Jesus is the one who establishes the apostles. He's the one who chooses the apostles. He pours His life into the apostles. The apostles are the foundation of the church. And it is their teachings which come to us now in the form of the New Testament, which are all books that are either written directly by an apostle or by someone who was one generation removed from an apostle but was trained by an apostle, like John Mark or like Luke. Uh, these are the teachings of the apostles, the Word of God, the New Testament. But what do you think the apostles were teaching? They were teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ which becomes what we have as the New Testament, but they're also teaching about the Old Testament, the scripture that Christ taught and that he fulfilled. It's the entire word of God. So first and foremost, in a spirit-filled church, is there is a devotion, the word is. They are devoted, or they were devoted. There is a devotion to the teaching of the word of God, the teaching of the apostles, and there is a devotion to the learning of the Word of God. When a church is on fire for the Lord, when a church is being what it's supposed to be and is truly filled by the Holy Spirit, then the body of Christ will feed on the Word of God on a daily basis and crave to know more and more and more about the Lord as revealed in the Word. A church that doesn't feed on the Word of God? Not a New Testament church. A church that doesn't have the Word of God as its primary focus in worship? Not a New Testament church. And they claim it, but they're not living it. The Word of God is central to the worship of the people of God. The Word of God is central to what it means to be a Holy Spirit-filled Spirit church. And doesn't it make sense? Because who inspires the Word of God? This is where you say the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspires the Word of God. So doesn't it make sense that if we want to be a Spirit-filled church, that we're going to feed off of what He inspired for us so that we might learn about the Lord, learn about ourselves as compared to the Lord, and learn about what our response is. The earliest church from day one, primary, devoted to the teachings of the apostles, devoted to learning what the word says, learning what the apostles teach, and those who are in roles of teaching are committed to teaching.
the Word of God. It is a primary thing in the body of Christ. Look, we should not see the teaching and learning of the Word of God as a Sunday, Wednesday only thing. If we are people who have been born again, who have been covered by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, made new by the Spirit of God, then the, the, the Word of God should be something that we see as, as primary in our life. It should be something that we are, are, are dedicated to in the same way that we're dedicated to food for our bellies. In fact, we should see it as more important to know the, the, the bread of life, the Word of God, than, than to actually have food for our own bellies. It should be preeminent for us. It should be primary for us. Why? Because this is how God reveals Himself to His people. And if we want to be followers of the Lord, then we should crave that. Folks, the Word of God is given to us as a gift from the Lord. So that we might have a relationship with him and know who he is. So that we wouldn't be led astray in the false teachings. So that we would know right from wrong. We need to be feeding on the word of God on a daily basis. We need to be feeding on it in such a way that we speak it into each other's lives. And it comes out of us as we uh, live our day-to-day -day lives. That we relate to one another in such a way. Uh, that, that when we deal with the, the issues and problems of life, we are able to give answers that come from the Word of God, or at least are informed by the Word of God, if not directly uh, word for word from the Word of God. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit-inspired Word that's given to us so that we might be able to have a relationship with the Lord. The apostles and those 3,000 or so in that first day of the first church on the day of Pentecost devoted themselves to the Word of God, to the Apostles' teaching. It's that important. It is that important. For hundreds of years in the Middle Ages, the Word of God was taken away from the average person. The Bible had been translated. You know, the Bible, I'll give you a brief lesson here. The Bible was written originally, the Old Testament was written in mostly Hebrew. A little bit Aramaic and almost almost completely Hebrew, and the New Testament's written in Greek. And the Old Testament's written from about 1500 BC to about 400 BC. And the New Testament's written starting in somewhere in the late 40s to 50s AD, ends up around 90 or so AD. So, so by the end of the first century AD, after Christ, out of Domini, we um, we have the Bible. Well, in the 300s, the, the Bible was translated into Latin. Latin being the language of the Romans. And as the church starts to be centralized and more power in the church starts to be located in Rome, uh, Latin becomes the, the dominant language of the scripture. And as time goes on, it becomes the language of the church. And by the Middle Ages, uh, around 1000 AD and, and up into uh, into the, up to around 1500 or so AD, around the time of the Reformation, uh, Latin was the only language that it was legal for the Bible to even be written in. So if you didn't know Latin, you had no way of reading the Bible. And as, as a matter of fact, there was a time when it was against the law for a lay person, which is anyone who's not in ministry, to even have access to the Bible. They could, they could only hear the Word of God as read to them by the priests. In Latin, which they didn't know. They were literally robbed of the Word of God. We, because of the grace of the Lord, now have the Word of God in our own language. And if my guess is, if you all are like most Baptists, you've probably got more than one copy on your bookshelf at home. Or on your coffee table. I've got, who knows how many. I have no idea how many Bibles I have. There's no reason for us not to be in them. A spirit-filled church would be a church that is devoted to the teachings of the apostles, the teachings of the Word of God, and will feed on it on a regular basis. But they are also committed to the community of 
of the body of Christ. Fellowship, the body, a, a common life. Look at what the text says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And then go down to verse 44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And then in verse 46, and day by day, attending temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. It was a common purpose in the people. We, in our culture, come up, compartmentalize our Christianity way too much. We think of Christianity or our religion as something we do on Sunday. And it doesn't infect or affect anything that we do through the week. We have our jobs, we've got our families, whatever it may be. We've got our hobbies. We do those when we do those. But religion is something we do on Sunday and maybe for extra spiritual on Wednesday as well. But you see, that is a false view of what it means to be brought into the body of Christ. It's a false view, an incorrect view of what it means to be a born-again believer. Because the born-again believer is born again to be a part of the body of Christ. The text that uh, Devin read earlier said that we are not to forsake gathering together. Right? We're supposed to come together. We're supposed to be a part of one another. But I submit to you that, that having this common life and being committed to the community as is evident in this text of this earliest church, means more than just gathering together on Sunday or Wednesday. It means that we are committed to one another. When you become a part of the body of Christ, you are a part of a family. And the family is to look out for one another, to help one another, to speak good words into each other's lives, uplifting words. To correct when correction is needed. To exhort when exhortation is needed. We are to be a people who are interested first and foremost in our Lord and second in how that affects our lives living as one who's in the body of Christ with our families and the church. We, we need to be people who are committed to the body of Christ. A common life. These people were having fellowship together. They were breaking bread together. It says they received their food with glad, generous hearts, and they were breaking bread in their homes. You know, they, they didn't have this. They had the temple. We'll talk about that here in just a second. But they didn't have this. You know, for the first at least hundred years of the body of Christ, the whole idea of the church building was something they didn't, didn't even think about. Because they met in homes. Or they met in public places. But the idea that we had to have bricks and mortar in order to have a church was just foreign to them. Because the body of Christ is the people. And the people who were all saved by the same Lord, born again by the same Holy Spirit, brought into the family of God in the same way, should have interests in each other. We should be discipling one another. Uh, this is another sermon for another day. And I'll try not to get on my soapbox too much on this, but I pray that you're going to see more and more of this as we go forward in, uh, in our church life here together. But what is Jesus' final command in the book of Matthew to the, to the apostles of the body of Christ before he ascends? He says, Authority in heaven has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given me, excuse me. Go therefore and what? Make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them all that I have commanded you. And lo, I will be with you to the very end of the age. What's he saying there? He says, you, you, the, the purpose of the church, the reason for us is to make disciples. Well, when we think of making disciples, we think of sharing the gospel. And that's a part of it. But making a disciple isn't just simply seeing someone come to Christ. We can't make anyone come to Christ. We can only share the gospel. Making disciples is having common life, common purpose, a, a sense of community, a commitment to community and fellowship in the body, in the church. Where if you see someone 
who is hurting or has a need, you go to them and you ask them if you can pray for them. Or if there's someone who is not as far along the road in the Christian walk as you are, you take it upon yourself to go to them and try to meet up with them and try to help them along in their Christian walk. We should be looking out for one another in that way. There was that kind of commitment going on. Breaking bread together, eating together, having fellowship together, living together in many instances, sharing what they had. Now some people will take this text and try to, to use it as a proof text for communism. It's not a proof text for communism. Communism says what you have, we're taking and we're going to give it as we want. The Word of God says what you have, you have because the Lord God gave it to you and you should have an open hand policy towards others who are in need. It's a whole different mindset. But in the earliest church, they were uh, taking what was theirs. They were actually selling things so that they would have more income in order to help people who were in need. We should be helping one another spiritually. We should be helping one another uh, physically, temporally, in every way we possibly can. Look, there are folks in this church and in other churches as well in the Baptist life who have been walking with the Lord for decades. What are you doing with your Christian walk? Is it just about you? No. Pass it on. There are folks in this church and in other churches who have been walking with the Lord for decades. You, you should be actively seeking other brothers and sisters in Christ out who have not been walking as long as you and trying to help them in any way possible in their spiritual walk. It should be a common purpose in our body that we do these sorts of things. That we look out for one another. That we love one another. That we're committed to one another. <clears throat> this very thing is obviously not something that has been prominent in Baptist life for the last 50 years. The reason why I say that is because we Baptists uh, uh, don't even understand what church membership is. There are 16 million Baptists on Southern Baptist church rolls in the United States. You can find maybe 8 million of them. Statistics show that there are roughly 8 million actually go to church. So there are 8 million who are claimed to be members of the body of Christ don't even show up to the body of Christ. If I was one of those 8 million, I would be embarrassed to ever claim that I was a member of any church that I didn't actually go to. That's, that's, that's a ridiculous thing if you think about it on that surface. If you think about it from the context of the earliest church, the church of Pentecost, how committed they were to one another. They were committed to coming together and hearing the word of God from the apostles. They were committed to fellowship. They were committed to breaking bread. They were committed to having each other in their homes. They, they attended the temple together. They praised God together. Then how in the world, from that context and that mindset, could there ever be such a thing as someone who is a member of the church or doesn't come to the church? But what we think of as church membership, we think church membership is you get your name on the roll and you have the ability to vote on things so you have some sort of power to say so within the body. And that is the exact opposite of what it means. We, we see it as something that we do when we should understand that it's something that the Holy Spirit has done in you. If you're truly a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and you're truly a member of the body of Christ, then your desire should be to follow the Lord Jesus Christ with other members of the body of Christ and your desire should be to help any other member of the body of Christ in any way possible that you can. We've got, I don't know, uh, I don't know what the actual number of people on the church are here for when we this right now. It's, uh, it's a lot. Uh, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 600. Uh, maybe more than that. Maybe more than that. Uh, where are they? 
If there are other churches, they need to be members of other churches. Because if they claim to be a member here, but are attending another church, then what they are saying is, I don't want to go there, but I want to go to another church, but I don't want to actually get involved there either. So they're kind of like free agent Christians who kind of do their own thing, and they don't have to submit to anybody. And they don't have to look out for anybody, ultimately. It's not what the early church was. It's not what the, the old concept of being a part of the body of Christ is. Being a part of the body of Christ means that you are dedicated to the body of Christ. You are dedicated to seeing the body of Christ be what it's supposed to be in this world. You are dedicated to the people who make up the body of Christ. And your desire is to see them do well. And you will do whatever it takes in order to make sure that they walk with the Lord as they are supposed to and that you walk with the Lord and you're supposed to as well. It's not about having your name on a church roll. Save us from the horrible mindset that somehow I'm okay because my name's on a church roll. And save us from the horrible mindset that says I can be have my name on this particular church roll, but go wherever I want to go because I'm not really in covenant in any way with that church. Nonsense. If your name is on a church roll, if you are a member of a church, of a, of a Baptist church, whatever the denomination you're a part of, but we're in a Baptist context, if you are a member of Thornhill Baptist Church, that means you have publicly said, I am joining this particular body of Christ. I am going to be uh, willing to serve in this particular body of Christ. I'm going to be willing to look out for the well-being of this particular body of Christ. And therefore, I'm going to submit to those who are in this particular body of Christ. And if there ever comes a time when the Lord leads me away, then and only then, Will I leave this body of Christ? But we have people who leave because they don't like the music. Or because they don't like the color of the carpet that's picked in a business meeting. Or because they're not spending my money the way that, that I think they ought to. Let me give you another little fact boy. Once you give money to the church, it ain't your money. Get over it. It's not your money. Once you write that check and you hand money over, you are doing that supposedly for the well-being of the body of Christ because you're committed to the community, because you're committed to fellowship, and you want that body to prosper. And if the body, in, in, in its uh, uh, decision-making process to the leadership of the church and with the, the congregational system that we have in Baptist life, decides to, to use it in a way that uh, is not the way that you want to use it, Get over it. It's not your money. Because once you sign it over, it belongs to the body of Christ. Not yours. Not yours. We have to be committed to the community. We have to be committed to the fellowship of the body. We have to be committed to the common life of the body of Christ like these people were. These first believers, this first church, having fellowship together, breaking bread together. Praying together, worshiping together, uh, selling their possessions so that they would have extra income to help those who were in need. It's an amazing thing. And that's what we're supposed to be. And the Holy Spirit filled church will be like that. Will be like that. Number three, it's a worshiping church. They are a worshiping people. They are a worshiping people. They have fellowship, that's a part of worship. They uh, attend temple together, it says in verse 46. Day by day, they attending temple, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They receive their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. They're a worshiping church. They, they, they saw the act of worship as something that they were to do together. See, they didn't have this. But they didn't see themselves as a new religion. They saw themselves as the fulfillment of what Judaism was supposed to be. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. They're following the Jewish Messiah. 
They're following the one who's the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So what do they do? They go to the temple. Like any good Jew would do. Anyone who's following the Jewish Messiah had that go to the temple. That's what they did. And they went to the temple together. Can you imagine what it must have been like for these 3,000 new ones? Followers of Jesus to come to the temple in the day and time when the Sadducees, people who didn't even believe in the resurrection, actually ran the temple. And these 3,000 are coming because they are celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing to think about what was going on there. They were a worshiping church, though. They loved to worship the Lord, and they worshiped together. They had generous hearts and they praised God. How do we worship the Lord? We worship Him through song. We worship Him through giving. We worship Him through the Word of God. We worship Him through prayer. We worship Him through fellowship. All of that. The body of Christ has to be a worshiping church. Look, uh, you know, even though I think we make the mistake sometimes of calling the music part of our service the worship part of the service. Because the truth of the matter is, every bit of the service is worship. But I understand the concept of what's going on there. And when we are singing, we are supposed to be singing to the Lord. We're supposed to be singing in a way that, that honors the Lord. That, that, that is us giving ourselves over to the Lord. Whether we got a good voice or not. I have a good voice. Uh, some of you already heard me inform me of that. And that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But I'll tell you what, my voice may not be very pretty, but you're going to hear me sing if you're by me. Why? Because I'm with the body of Christ. I'm following my Lord and Savior. And I want to worship Him. And if singing is the way that we're worshiping Him at that moment, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. I get really, really concerned about believers who don't sing it. I do. I really do. And that may sound kind of juvenile, but I do. Because it's just basic to what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. They are a worshiping church that praise God. Do you praise God in your life? Do we praise God as we should? I think we've got a pretty good spirit going on in this place. I think things right now in this church seem to be going in a pretty good direction. I'm not naive enough to think that everything's perfect. Uh, because it's not going to be perfect this side of heaven. But I think we've got a pretty good spirit going on. But it can be better. We, we could sing more fervently. We could pray more uh, devotedly. We could thirst for the Word of God and be in the Word of God more actively. And we could be a part of the body of Christ, committed to the community of the body of Christ more directly. There's always room for us to be better than what we are. They were a worshiping church. They came together. They worshiped. They praised God. They were a joyful church. That's what the praising God was. Look, uh, Christians should be joyful people. And, and you've heard me before. If you've been around here any time at all, I probably said this. Joy is not the same thing as happiness. Happiness is something that's temporary. Happiness is something that... that you know, the analogy I like to use, I get happy when I go to the, to the buffet line at the barbecue house, right? Uh, that's happy. 30 minutes later, I'm usually not so happy. And I'm, you know, I'm eating too much and, and I'm not feeling too well. Happy is something that happens when your team wins. But it's something that goes away when you break your car on the way from the game, right? Joy is something that is always there. It's deep-seated. It's, it's rooted in your heart, rooted in your soul. Why? Because it is a recognition that I am not my own. My sin is paid for in the Lord Jesus Christ. I belong to Him. And therefore, no matter what happens in my life, I can get through it. And that is joy. It causes joy to come forward. And it looks like happiness many times. And the two are very closely related. But it's different. And the body of Christ should always be joyful. When we worship Him and we praise Him, there is reverence, but there is a joyful reverence that's going on. We should be joyful people. We have everything because of what the Lord Jesus has done for us. The first church, the earliest church, were joyful. 
They, they, they gave thanks in their home. They generous hearts. They praised the Lord. They enjoyed being in the presence of one another. Do you enjoy being in the presence of the body of Christ? Man, come to church makes me happy. There's that word, right? But joy comes out of my heart when I'm living around the body of Christ. It really does. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, an introvert in, in many ways, have been a good bit of my life. Uh, my wife likes to say that the first year or two of our marriage, uh, that, that uh, she would intentionally sit there and try to talk just to see if I would respond because I just didn't talk that much. Uh, I'm better than I used to be. So I'm not by nature a joyful person. But when I think about what the Lord's done for me, and I think about the body of Christ, and the fact that He hasn't just done it for me, He's done it for everybody who's part of the body of Christ, I get joyful. I am thrilled by that. And the idea of coming together on Sunday morning or Sunday evening or Wednesday night and, and being a part of this, and the idea for me uh, being gifted uh, to, to, to uh, teach. Everybody's got their gift. The Holy Spirit gives. Mine's teaching and preaching. And I, I am thrilled to be able to exercise that gift amongst the body of Christ. There's nothing more exciting than that to me. Nothing. We have to be joyful people. What's the Lord given for you to do? What's the gift that He's given for you in the body of Christ? Use it. Whatever it is. Doesn't mean you've got to be in a specific role to use it, by the way. You may have a gift to teach, but there may not be a spot specifically in the Sunday school class for you to teach. Well, guess what? This is where that sense of community comes together. You find someone who, who is not as far along in their walk with you, and you get together with them, and you start, start gathering with them on a regular basis, and you start going through the Word of God together and use that gift to teach you to help teach them. You don't have to be a Sunday school teacher to do that. We need to be joyful people. And then lastly, in a spirit-filled church, there are people being saved on a regular basis. There are people being added to the number. The last verse says, they're praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, that's a different time. It's the beginning of the church. An amazing thing took place at Pentecost. The Spirit poured out in that way in a way that it hasn't been since, quite frankly. But, there were people being added to the body. That does not mean there's got to be someone saved every week. But it does mean that the body of Christ needs to be people who are actively seeking those who are lost, actively seeking in our own personal life those who need the Lord. And that in a Holy Spirit-filled work, a Holy Spirit-filled church, you will start to see people who we come in contact with who start to come to Christ. You will start to see the body swell. And you will start to see people added to the number of the body of Christ in a Holy Spirit-filled church. What? Because it's the work of the Lord. It's what God's doing. It's what He sent His Son for ultimately. To save sinners. And the Holy Spirit is the one that brings conviction to sinners. And the gospel is the message that's used to bring that conviction. And the Holy Spirit applies the heart and mind of those who are lost. And if we are a Holy Spirit-filled church, we will be people who are being obedient to that command that I told you about at the end of Matthew. Making disciples of all nations. You know, and how do you make disciples? Well, we can't make them, but we can share the gospel with them. That's how you do it. And if we are, are, are a Holy Spirit-filled church, then we, not just the pastor, not just the deacons, not just the Sunday school teachers, but everybody is part of the body of Christ. But we people who are willing to tell others about Jesus. And if we are, we'll know it because the number will start to multiply of people who are genuinely saved. Because the Lord blesses that. The Lord blesses that. But there's one more thing beyond those five points that I want to bring out. It's all the way back up in verse 43. It 
It says, and let me start back from 42 and read through 43 just so we get this right. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and prayers. And prayers. That's one thing that I, that I miss, quite frankly, prayers, part of worship. We are a prayerful people. But, going forward, verse 43, and all came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done to the apostles. Let's, we read that and kind of the way our brains work, we automatically connect the awe that's in the souls of the believers. We connect that to the signs and wonders that are taking place to the apostles. But notice how the text is actually given to us. And all came upon every soul. Come. And many wonders and signs were being done to the apostles. So the awe wasn't connected to the signs and wonders by the apostles. It's part of it. But the awe is connected to what goes before it. The fact that, that they were hearing the apostles teaching, the fact that they were having fellowship, the fact that they were breaking bread together, the fact that they were praying together, the fact that they were being the body of Christ. That's where the awe came in. They were in awe of their church. It filled them with awe to be a part of the body of Christ. And yes, the apostles were doing many miraculous things. And, and we don't have apostles in this day and time, but, but we shouldn't be surprised when the Lord does uh, miraculous things in and through the body of Christ. The most miraculous thing being bringing a dead person in sin to life in the new birth. But there was a sense of awe amongst the people to be a part of the body of Christ and what that really meant. I submit to you that virtually every problem that every Southern Baptist church ever has or any other congregational church or any other church in general ever had would virtually go away if, if we genuinely had a sense of awe about being a part of the body of Christ that these people had 2,000 years ago. Does it fill you with a sense of wonder and amazement that you are a part of the body of Christ? Does it fill you with a sense of, of awe that the Lord has saved you in such a way that He's adopted you into His family, that He's given you His Word, that He's given you the Holy Spirit, that He has giving you the body of Christ so that you don't have to go it alone, so that you can exercise the gifts that He also gives you uh, amongst others who are like-minded with you so that you can worship Him and celebrate Him together? Doesn't that fill you with a sense of all oh, love? This is a lost and dying world. It's a, it's a hard world to live in. It's a difficult world to live in. You don't want to go it alone because it will just eat you up and devour you. But we have the gift of the body of Christ. We've got each other. <coughs> look around the room for a second. I'm not asking. Look, look around the room. Seriously, look around the room. Turn around and look. We aren't necessarily the prettiest bunch. Or the healthiest bunch, or the strongest bunch, or the wealthiest bunch. But we are the body of Christ. And therefore, we are the most important single entity in the universe according to God. And the people that you looked around at, assuming they are all in the body of Christ as well, assuming come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and a vast multitude uh, I, I'm positive or I believe have. I can't speak to anybody's heart in particular. But just look around folks. This is what Jesus died for ultimately. Doesn't that sit to you with a sense of awe? To be able to come together and worship Him together and celebrate Him together serve Him together and serve one another together. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing gift towards Him and us. Don't fritter away over petty jealousies. 
Don't fritter it away over your own desires. Be in all of it. And do everything we possibly can, each of us, to make it what it's supposed to be. Glorious to the Lord himself. As we come to the time of the hymn of invitation, which is going to be only trust him, which is hymn number 317 in the hymn of as Jerry comes to lead us, the ladies come to play. My prayer is that all of us who are in the body of Christ, all of us who know the Lord as our Savior, after reading His words, after hearing the word of God, will commit ourselves, commit ourselves to being what the church is supposed to be, to making the things that are important to the Lord important to us. Looking out for the body of Christ. But if there be any here who are not a part of the body of Christ because you've never come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then I want to take just a minute to tell you what it means to be in the body of Christ, how you come to be in the body of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ came to live for you and died for you because you are in and of yourself under the wrath of God. You are a sinner. You are an imperfect being. God sent His Son to live for you and die for you in such a way that His perfect life, if you will trust Him, will be applied to your life. And the sacrifice that He made at the cross, if you will trust Him, will be applied to your sin. And the Scripture is very clear. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God is raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. If we are open about calling the Lord, if, if, if we give ourselves over, and it's the God, the Jesus of the Bible. Salvation comes to your house. The Holy Spirit comes to your life. And you are a part of the body of Christ. And all that we've read in this Acts text applies to you. If there's anybody in this room who needs to know the salvation of the Lord, the invitation is there. If there's anybody in this room who's a follower of the Lord and you just need to get something right, the invitation is there. Whatever your response should be, as the Lord guides you, respond to Him. And we will give all praise and honor and glory to Him. Stand with me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Then Jerry will lead us in open and trust Him. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your love and Your grace and Your mercy. Thank You for Your Word. Thank You for Your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank You for the Holy Spirit. Thank You for the body of Christ. Lord, I love this church. They have been very, very good to me and my wife in the short time that we've been here. I'm so grateful for that. And I already know from the time that I've been around here that there is a desire for unity and there is a desire for your word. But I pray, Lord, that we would have a desire for you in such a way as a body that we would live out in every way what it means to be the body of Christ. Lord, pour your spirit out on us in such a way that the world can see that there's something different in Thornhill Baptist Church, something good, something wonderful, something that cannot be uh, bought, cannot be gained in the world. Help us to reveal Christ to a lost and dying world. But help us to reveal Christ to one another. In the way that we talk to one another, in the way that we act towards one another, in the way that we help one another, in the way that we pray for one another. Help us to be what we're supposed to be. Lord, I pray that for being in this room who don't know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that at this moment, that your Holy Spirit would convert in them, and that they would bow the knee to the only Savior, Jesus. Lord, I pray for us as a body here at Thornhill that all that we say and all that we do would honor you. We give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' precious name.